those four things. Those are the four things. I didn't know I was doing it, but I did. Because I look back, reflecting and writing this book, and what did I do that kept giving me these results? It was those four things. Learning, taking action, staying persistent, and being inspired every day. When you're driven, the need to accomplish a goal is relentless. Hard work and ambition compel you to do whatever's necessary. In my work as a personal injury trial lawyer for 18 years, it's common to meet driven people. Those with drive can have different personalities, careers, or backgrounds, but they possess one common factor. Despite their passions, driven people want to surround and motivate themselves with other driven people. If you want to learn how to overcome obstacles by learning from others, then tune in here. This is the Driven Crowd Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to episode 35 of the Driven Crowd Podcast, fueled by Snelling's Law. Today, I'm excited to introduce our next guest, Tony Kirtland. Tony's a wizard in sales, and his resume includes selling over $200 million in products and services, completing over 400,000 cold calls, and setting up over 4,000 appointments. He's the CEO of Onset, or I'm sorry, Set One Sales, the host of the Set One Sales podcast, and is launching Tune Sales Academy. He's also the esteemed sales speaker, and he has just released his debut book, Million Dollar Sales Tune-Up. Tony, welcome to the Driven Crowd Podcast. Thank you for having me, Scott. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Thank you. you. All right. So we start off with everyone. Give us a little bit of history. What's your background? Where'd you grow up? Okay. So I was born in Istanbul, Turkey. My mom's uh, side is from, my mom's mother's from Chicago. My mom's father was an exchange student from Turkey in 1939-38 at the University of Illinois. Uh, They met my grandmother, Margaret Davis, from Chicago, Welsh German, and my grandfather's, you know, Turkish exchange student getting his doctorate. And they met, fell in love, got married, went back to Turkey, had six kids. My mom was the oldest. So when we were two, we came to the States. We came to Dallas, Texas, 1979. I was two. My brother was four. So that's an integral part of – in the book, when, when we get to some of the stuff that, um, where my drive comes from, right. Mm. Being technically immigrants coming here and watching my father and what you go through the, the, the type of drive and grind it takes to be successful. But, uh, yeah, so right there. So we started off Dallas eventually as my father learned English Richardson and then Plano, right. So it started Plano schools about eighth grade, um, East Plano, um, East side of Plano university of North Texas, got my degree in business there, and then got out and uh, started looking for work in sales. So that's really the quick synopsis. But. Yeah, absolutely perfect. So want to go back to the beginning. Okay. Uh, do you remember being in Turkey? I assume not if you no. were two when you came over. No, I don't remember being in Turkey. Uh, we landed in New York City, um, which I, the reason I tell that is my I, I got lost at the airport. And my parents were going, I'm two years old. And they look, I had got on the conveyor, the, the luggage conveyor belt. And I was, <laughs> I was coming out, I was coming out the backside on the conveyor belt on a piece of luggage. So I remember that. So um, you've um, always had your spunk and energy. Yes. Then. <laughs> I've always been a little bit go, go, go for better or for worse. We're going, we're, right. mo- we're moving. Yeah. All right. So you get here, your, your dad didn't speak English. I'm assuming you didn't either. No, I didn't. I'm two. My brother's four. My mom speaks English. She went to American girls schools in, in, in uh, Istanbul and her mom, you know, they, they spoke English and Turkish and uh, yeah. Okay. So what was it like um, as far back as you can remember? I'll put it that way. Far back as I can remember. Um, I'll tell you a story that will personify it. I remember we were living in Richardson. I was going to James Bowie Elementary um, and I was one of the more athletic kids in school. We had a, a race, a, a, um, a run we would do where they'd put a piece, the chalk, the chalk eraser yeah. at the end of the gym and you'd go pick it up and, and there's you grab it and come back and they time you. And I had one of the fastest times in school. And, um, my PE coach, she said, look, my husband has a, a football team, Spring Valley Athletes Association, SVAA. It's played at Fretz Park off a of belt line there in Richardson. And, um, I got all the paperwork. I was excited. I went home and I gave it to my mother and she said, we can't afford this. It was a hundred dollars. And I asked my mom at the time, she said we were living on about $400 a month at the time. So I'm asking for a hundred bucks. Yeah. Right. We don't have a fourth of the income, fourth of the income at the time. And this was in late eighties, mid eighties. And, uh, so I go back to the teacher and I say, I can't, you know, she said, no problem. And then she comes back a couple days later and says, me and my husband would like to sponsor you. So it's, it's one of the first things 
or first time someone did something for me that changed my life. It helped me get into sports, football, uh, which eventually led to judo. And those were the two uh, integral parts of my life, changing my life as far as being on a team and being a part of something bigger than yourself. And gave me a lot of the, um, the things that, I, that, that made me successful, my discipline, learning to take, do your part on a team, right? How teamwork works, you know, Scott, me and Scott can speak to that. But um, that's one of the first memories I have is starting football in Richardson and the the, co the PE coach and her husband sponsored me to play. And I played on the Steelers and we got to the first day of practice and they needed a running back and they lined us up and I just, I, I outran everybody and they're like, all right, you're the running back. I didn't even... <laughs> And I very didn't, scientific. Yeah, very scientific. And I didn't even know how to hold the football, right? So I, I would hold it like a loaf of bread up and down like this. And um, from there, that led to judo. So it was kind of a chain reaction. But that's what I really remember, um, my first real memory of childhood. I remember other stuff like BMX bikes and stuff. But my, my memory in childhood starts in Richardson, right? Mm -hmm. Elementary school in Richardson of me remembering James Bowie Elementary. That's that's funny that you bring up SBAA. My, my father-in-law, Gary Penn, uh, was heavily involved, ah. refed all kinds of different sports and okay. SBAA. So awesome. definitely a small world. Small world. Uh, so tell me this, you know, you start off in football, team sport. Yep. That moves to judo Correct. and visual sport. Correct. What are the differences in terms of what you learned in terms of being on a team? Right. And then having everything on your own shoulders in the individual sport. Correct. So the way football started is after our, our games at, uh, our games for the Steelers on the Pee Wee League, SBA, were Saturdays. After one, after one Saturday, we were walking through the rec center to get a soda after the game or a snack. And we stopped and we saw um, two kids wrestling. It looked like they had in white karate outfits, I thought. Right. And it was, uh, they were doing judo. One, one through the other one. And this is before, you know, MMA and it's all r very, r very large right now. Um, the teacher was an ex-Marine, Marshall Siegel, and he drove a red Porsche. I'll always remember that. <laughs> and uh, it's funny the things you remember. Uh, and I was rump rambunctious in school. You know, I was getting fighting and, you know, people say something and I was quick to be aggressive physically. And my parents thought, you know, football's helping. And they had a program to help out people that couldn't quite, you know, afford it all the way to, to be able to do the judo because it's a rec, right? It's a rec sure. center. So we, we started judo. And what I learned right away was the first thing they did is the discipline, right? Football taught me discipline, but I was so athletic, I didn't have to be as disciplined. I was fast at, pretty fast, right? You give me the ball and I could outrun you. And when you did catch up to me, I, I could get you off me. Judo, it's one-on-one, -on -one, you're right there. And there's discipline in doing the steps in judo, right? And cut, having your come into class clean, right? Your fingernails are cut, toenails are cut, hair is groomed. You follow when the sensei, the teacher says stop, you stop. When he says go left, you go left. There wasn't room for you did it the way it was either it was yes or no, black or white. Mm. So that was the biggest thing. Football has discipline, but at that age, you're so young that it's not like the high level of football. As you go up in football, the discipline tightens. Right. You have to do it the right way or you're going to not – be open, the quarterback's waiting for you to be right there and you're not there. But I think at an early age, at that level, it was my first entry into discipline. And number two, I got humbled right away, mm. right? Football, I was naturally good at it without much practice. You just give me the ball and I could basically outrun you. Um, judo, the first thing they did, well, the teacher, Sensei Marshall Siegel, asked my parents, so what's going on with him? He's very aggressive at school. You know, someone says something, there's no really talking it out. He just starts fighting. He said, okay, I know what to do with him. So first thing he did was put me up against gir girls my age. For the first several weeks, I went there on the Saturdays. And they just beat me up. The girls would throw. I couldn't do anything because you can't punch. It's throwing. If you don't know what judo is, it's Japanese wrestling, right? Right. So um, it's it's throws, it's foot sweeps, right? It's arm, it's grappling like jujitsu. Very technical. Yes, judo. Yeah, very technical. Judo comes from jujitsu. Judo is the gentle way. Right? So Dr. Jigoro Kano, who invented judo, was looking at jujitsu. And when they were practicing jujitsu back then, they were actually breaking arms in practice. There mm. was no tapping out. So he went and, and they throw you, they throw you right on your head. So judo, you do a judo roll. We throw you, you tuck, right? You're able to keep fighting. We're not going to injure you. You can tap out. So that was added in and it was a good fit for me. It humbled me to know that you know, physicality isn't the only way. Someone who in judo was made for the smaller person to take on a larger person because it's a leverage getting underneath somebody, moving them into the right position. A lot of things that 
are helpful in business, right? The discipline to do what's necessary. And that's this, though, these two sports were the foundation of my success in business. It's funny you asked that, but the, the duality of the different things I learned, right? But I got humbled very quickly to understand that you can, someone can be not as strong and still defeat you. Yeah. And, you know, I, I grew up in Taekwondo. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I still attribute a lot of who I am towards is, yeah. you know, all of those years growing up with that discipline and not only the discipline, but the self-confidence as well. Yeah. I remember going into, you know, my very first tournament and I think I was like seven years old. And the day before we had kind of a, a tournament class, I'm like, hey, here's how it operates. Here's what you do. Yeah. And I remember I had to stand up in front of, I don't know, 25, 30 other kids yeah. and get up there and, you know, say my name and what caught I was going to do. And I teared up. I may have flat out cried. I don't remember. It's been yeah. a minute. Yeah. But going from that to, you know, six months later, didn't bother me yeah. a bit. Built I was starting to see, you know, success. And then it just built from there. So the self-confidence yeah. aspect of it, knowing that you can take care of yourself, but Million also percent. confidence and just how you relate to other people. Right. And then it also built a mindset, right? My football mm. team was successful. Judo, I became successful through a different type of hard work. It was doing the steps. And then judo from there, I got, we got me and my brother, we, we did the judo together. We, we got to a point where Marshall Siegel, our sensei, was like, look, we're going to recommend you to a better place. So we got recommended to Dallas Judo Institute, Tamora Judo. Tamora Judo is a magical place. Mr. Vincent Sensei Tamora, um, Japanese immigrant, first, first judo club in Chicago, 1956. One of the, was referee when a judo became a, a official Olympic sport in the Olympics. He refereed in the Olympics. Wow. So um, world renowned. And, um, you know, all the top um, mixed martial artists came there. So Mr. Tamura was Aikido, Jiu Jitsu, and Judo. So some of the first MMA guys, you know, your Dan Severins, your Oleg Tektarovs, your Ken Shamrocks, uh, this was before weight classes. They would come roll with us. And I was a little kid. Wow. So I was around some real, um, if you thought you could fight, uh, yeah. That's yeah, who you he, went to go see. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so and that's how you learned. It was old school way. You know, I was nine, 10 years old fighting grown men, black belts. So when the tournament came up, and that was another thing that judo taught me, like you prepare, you over-prepare. If you're, if you're going to run 400 meters, you run 800 to prepare. You, and that's part of like the success in business. It's funny how sports sets you up for that, mm -hmm. right? It gives you those intangibles when you're going through, you don't realize it, but when you're contemplating is, you know, where did, you know, where did this drive come from? Where did this success come from? What do I keep doing over and over again that gets me, no matter where I sell, I'm able to keep getting these results. And, and that's really where it stems from. So let me switch back over to the team side sure. of things. Uh, we played football together. I remember you yes. as, as a fantastic teammate. Thank you. Tell me, on the teammate side, right, you can't control everything. No. Right? You can't make the blocks. You can't right. throw the ball. You can't catch the ball. You can't run it into the right. end zone. You can't make all the tackles. Correct. So you have to rely on other people. Correct. How did growing up in the team sport atmosphere teach you, or I guess what did it teach you in terms as you moved into the sales arena? What lessons did you pull from right. that? Right. So from the team sport, spe specifically when you're not being a – being on the team teaches you how to lead a team, I truly believe. And I think the things that I learned being on a team that helped that translated to sales, it's exactly what you said. You have to focus on your job, do your job to the best of its ability. And, and um, you know, I think when you played with me, I think people understood that what I, the, how, what I, you know, how I handled myself, right? Right. At practice, I mean, I'll, I'll put it out there. I don't think anybody went harder than me in practice. And people would, people would tell me, calm down, it's just practice. But if you look to the forward of this book, it's written by Coach Joey McCullough. Yeah. Who is our coach at Plano East. Yep. And I, I love Coach, right? Great mentor. And, you know, he writes it in the book. I took the same work ethic, right? The same things from the team and it just translated it. It just translated directly. But I think the main thing is when you're on a team, you got to do the, you got to take care of you first, right? If you're the receiver, you need to know your routes. You need to know what's expected of you, do your job, right? right? And then and then when I truly believe when you're on a team and you do your job a certain way, it resonates because people look over and they say, look at this guy. 
He knows his plays. I didn't miss a day of practice. I didn't complain at practice. I came to practice. I went 100%, 110% to where people were, you remember, people yeah. telling me to calm down. It's right. just practice. But you, you, I truly believe you play the way you practice. So the number one thing that translated is how you practice is how you perform, right? Yeah. And, and nowadays, you know, TikTok to Instagram, the quick, I call it the quick generation. They want it right now. Right, you can't just make four hundred thousand calls in uh, uh, two years. That's a hundred plus calls a day. You can do the math: a hundred plus calls a day, right, for twenty five, thirty years, and that's how you get to over four hundred thousand phone calls. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a hundred phone calls today, right? I made a hundred phone calls yesterday. I'll make another home. It's just in me. It's happening. That day, a hundred people are getting called for one reason or another, either be an interview on a podcast, or or for a client, whatever it may be. It's instilled in me, but. I think that that's I think what translated from t- from team to to team sports to sales professional right. sales. So you clearly have a, an amazing ethic, work ethic, uh, whether you know through judo, through football. Obviously, hundred calls a day that's a lot. Where does that come from? Good, good, uh, good question. So my book starts off. So my father is a big part um, in a big part of my my um, my journey, and I start the book off. Uh, with a story, and and that's part of you know the speaking engagements I do. I I, I tell I tell my mess the message through certain stories that I've been through. So, the 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 speech is called "Walk to the Doors That Are Open." So it starts off. I get out of University of North Texas in two thousand. Um. So, I have uh, I have my degree. I worked as a waiter at Olive Garden, uh, full time. And this is uh, many people do this. It's not a. I think it's it's a typical grind. A lot of people, right? So, but I drove from Plano. Um, so let me take one step back. So I went to University of North Texas. I walked on for football. Sixty people walked on. Five made it. I made it. But you're on the practice. And you're on the practice squad. Da-da-da. I tear up my knee. End up having to move back home. So it's okay. Just focus on school. So two days a week, I drive to Denton from Plano, an hour, an hour each way. Right. Um, I take full class load. This is for four years. The other five days a week, I'm working 12, 15, 16 hours a day at Olive Garden, double shifts to pay for everything. I do that for four years. I get out with my degree and I'm, you know, they promise me you get this degree and the doors will open, right? That's what the counselors tell you. <laughs> it's funny. Like, You're going to immediately start yeah. making six figures. Uh-huh. Just get that college degree. The champagne will fall from the heavens. <laughs> and uh, the champagne didn't fall from the heavens. No. So I go on 50 interviews and back then, you know, schools didn't really prepare. And I don't want to talk bad about North Texas. North Texas is a great school, but there wasn't training on what your resume should look like. The internet's, mm pretty much dial up ish. There's not a lot of information to what the resume should look like, how you should even dress for the interview, much less. Right. Right. Or how you should portray yourself. You know, just there's information's out there right now. So I went on 15 interviews, no job offer. Um, I eventually get one job offer. It's selling trailers in Waxahachie, straight commission. It's a job you can get without a college degree. I come home, I'm punching holes in the wall. My father flies in the room he goes, what's going on? Throws me against the wall. He goes, what's going on? I said, I said, Dad, I went and got this piece of paper. They promised me, you know, if I get this paper, I said, I got one job selling, you know, trailer straight commission an hour away. And he goes, he put his head down. And my father said, you're embarrassing me, son. I said, what do you mean, Dad? He said, you remember when we got here? I said, you remember me working three jobs, sleeping in my car. He's an engineer by trade, washing dishes, cutting mm-hmm. grass, and then going to learn English at night, Right. You remember me doing that, son? I said, yes. He said, did they give me any opportunities, son? I said, no. He said, how many opportun- How many doors are open, son? I said, there's one door open, dad. He said, walk through the doors that are open, son. And those words have ring in my ears, have, have, those words have r- rung in my ears my whole career. So I said, okay, I got one opportunity. I said, I'm gonna do it. I've never complained ever again in my career. And I'll tell you where it took me. I walk into... The, the 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 job. They walk me to the the break room, the coffee room. The desk is about that big. There's a rotary dial phone, a list of numbers, and a pencil. The guy says, "Start calling." I turn to him. I go, "Is there training for these these calls?" He starts laughing. He says, "Sell something in sixty days, or you're fired." So right away, the pillars of my system. I thought back, what did I do? I started learning every day. 
I read everything I could get. How do I make these calls? What do I say? When they say no, how do I get the appointment? What am I going to do? Then I took action. I didn't wait. I don't do passive. I, marketing is great. Mar, all the marketers out there, God bless. I don't, marketing has a, a purpose, but after they fill out the form, then sales starts, right? Right. Someone has to contact them, right? So I'm a- active, right? So those are the habits, learning every day, taking action every day, right? That's the, those are the first two pillars of my, of my system. What the, the mindset, staying persistent, right? Overcoming challenges, having a mindset of understanding that it's going to be majority no, right? 97, 98% no. That's what professional sales is. No, 98%. You just got to have the volume that two to 3% will make you wealthy. And mm. I can speak to that. So a persistent mindset, right? Right. And then inspiration, being inspired every day, finding a source of, of, of push, pushing you, right? So habits and mindset, those four things, those are the four things. I didn't know I was doing it, but I did. Because I look back, reflecting and writing this book, and what did I do that kept giving me these results? It was those four things. Learning, taking action, staying persistent, and being inspired every day, right? So it came from my father's words. And I'll tell you, um, so I started moving, making calls. Do, you know, I just kept calling and calling and calling and calling and calling and calling. And um, I started selling one here, one there. The average person was selling seven a year. And um, one day, uh, a guy pulled up, old farmer pulled up in a pickup truck, dusty overalls, old Chevy, Silverado truck. He gets out. My manager looks. Yeah, he goes, ah, he prejudges him. He goes, ah, hey, rookie, you get him. I said, no problem. I got him. Comes in. Yes, sir. No, sir. Don't skip any steps with him. I take him back, ask him all the questions, you know, show him everything he's, that fits what he's looking for. As he's walking out, he turns around. He said, Tony, I'll be in touch with you. Shakes my hand. I said, yes, sir. He leaves. Turns out this guy owns five mobile home parks, about to open five more. He puts in an order for 50 homes. <laughs> At that point, my father's e- words ring in my ear again. Walk through the doors that are open, son. You have to remember, I, I, I left my job at Olive Garden to look for work full time. Right. The gas in my car is borrowed. The clothes I'm wearing is borrowed. The food, is, the money for the food I'm eating is borrowed. The gun is to my head. I had to move, right? And coming up to that point, we go back to the sports and that's what, you know, in a no-win situation, just keep moving, right? Taking action. That's why one of our mottos is every day, right? Take action, stay persistent and set one, set that appointment. That's what I say at the end of my podcast. And that's, our, that's really our motto. And that's, and I'll tell you just to add on to it just real quick. So from there, so I made a good chunk of money, but that same person comes back in about a year or so and says, Tony, let's go to dinner. I say, yes, sir. And, um, he said, I just bought a insurance brokerage in London, England, selling AIG insurance. Do you want to be my salesperson in London? I said, yeah, I'll do that. We're selling. The lo- <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. We're, I will do that. I will do that. We're selling the large association groups and within, you know, I'm over there making calls and people are saying, and it's, it's a funny story. So people are saying, I'm calling and it's part of the book, right? Making adjustments when things aren't working. You track your KPIs, your key performance yep. indicators. When it's not working, you make the adjustment. So I'm making calls, right? So he puts me at the Millennium Gloucester Hotel and Casino in London. It's in Kensington, one of the wealthier areas of London. And I'm in the hotel room making calls and they're asking me, are you calling me from the States? And that's my British accent. My attempt, very nice, very my nice. My attempt at my British accent. To our Texan ears, that's, Texan that sounds yeah. very British. Yeah, so are you calling me from the States? I said, no, no, I'm here. I'm here. They said, okay, they hang up on me. I said, what can I do to set these appointments? So I get a map of London or whatever city I was calling, Manchester, and I found where all the coffee, sh- coffee shops were. So the next day, and it took me a week or so to get that down, but I kept making my calls. And I finally, I got down to the coffee shop. So if I'm calling an area, I'd have the coffee shops close to whoever I was calling, ready to go. They say, are you calling me from the States? I said, no, no, I'm here. I'll tell you what, about an hour, you want to meet me at this coffee shop? So I flipped it on its head mm. just to see if I was telling the truth, they'd meet me. So I land my first account, large account, 7 million members. We have 10 products to do a mailing, right? They spawn, put their logo on that mail head, uh, mailer. And they said, come pick up your commission check, right? And I'll just say it was, uh, we're getting into numbers, it was 750,000 pounds. And back then it was times two for US dollars. And at that point, my father's words, 
ring in my ears. Walk through the doors that are open. And that's the message I portray. Opportunities don't come wrapped in beautiful packaging and shine like a diamond. Opportunities come the way opportunities come. I truly believe, it, I truly believe it's up to you to make it shine, right? Because if I don't take that job and I say, ah, go back, I'll wait tables until a better opportunity, a better opportunity comes. Mm. I don't sell those 50 homes. I don't end up in London. And in London, I was there several years and I come back and I buy my first company, right? The whole, my whole trajectory changes, right? Because you walk through that one open door. door. Walk through the doors that are open. So let me ask you this, you know, sales is, that's a tough gig. To your point, 97, 98% of what you hear is no. Correct frustrating, yep. humiliating, yeah. nobody likes hearing no. no. But what is it inside of you that got you, because that hurts our ego, right? That hurts our ego here and there. Sure. How did you internally say, you know what, I'm gonna put my ego aside here and I'm gonna focus on the two to 3% that are gonna say yes. Correct. And I'm going to focus on my method. Correct. Right, because a lot of us, you know, we, we hear no, we, we continue to do the same thing, Correct. right? continue to try cases and get terrible results, you got to change Correct. or you're just going to get it, the same results. So that's, it, so it's funny. So it's a, a thing that I have, I call smart persistence, right? Okay. You, you, so our system- I assume that's an acronym because you're an acronym guy. Yeah, I'm an acronym guy. The whole book is acronyms. <laughs> it's acronyms, better or for worse, but smart persistence, right? And smart persistence, what I mean when I say that is, that's why, our, so our, our, my process, the tune sales system, which is, Trust, urgency, need, and emotion. We can get into that later, but yep. it's eight steps. Sales strategy, qualifying prospects, cold sales outreach, tracking KPIs, key performance indicators, making adjustments, re-engagement, setting appointments, and sales presentations to close. You track your activity. I know, for example, I'll start with this. If I talk to 100 people on the phone, I should set three plus appointments. Talk to, not dial. Mm. talk to. If I talk to a hundred people, I should set three plus appointments. If I don't, something's wrong. That's how you know when something's wrong. You're not hitting the KPI. Do you understand the, the measurement of it? Right? So that's what keeps you sane. But, right. but the truth of it is there's nothing normal about it. Mm. it. You're dialing into a black hole. Right? I say there's nothing sexy about it. You're in a room, you're saying the same script, the, the, the no's are the same no's. You know, we have someone doing it, you know, you know, it's just typical. We don't have the money. Who are you? How'd you get my number? Or just a click, right? right. All these, but the, and, the, and the, how you handle those are the same way. And you keep going. And I'll tell you, early in my career, it was tough. You had to build that resilience. You build, it's like taking a thousand jump shots. Eventually, as soon as the ball hits your hand, you just click and it goes in. And it's like, wow, that looked automatic. It becomes automatic, but you understand that no is part of the process. A lot of these things are cliche, but they're true. Right? No is part of sales. 400,000 plus phone calls, 98% no's, 2% success rate, but that's successful. The irony. It's a majority of no's, but it does. But, and I will say this you have to sell higher ticket items for that, for this, for that right. type of, um, those type of numbers. But it's, it's understanding you're tracking it. When it's not going right, make the adjustments, but you have to have the, you have to have the activity. And it's, it's a hard puzzle to figure out because a lot of people ship it out. They give a virtual assistant to do it. They're not, you're not going to get the same result. Right. You're not. You got to have somebody that's expensive to get that result, right? I don't know if that answers. Yeah, it okay. does. So on those days where you're batting zero, yeah. it's 4.30, you haven't set a single appointment. Yeah. How do you keep that energy up, right? You're an energy guy. Right. How do you, on that 4.45 phone call, when they actually answer the phone, how do you keep the energy up when you've been trying to do it all day long with zero success? Good question. So when you're batting zero like that, you have to understand the numbers, right? Because all the points, sometimes you get the appointments in the first three calls, right? Sometimes you get the appointments the last day of the week or it's next week. So it's understanding the numbers count as a whole, right? not as one day. And that's as humans, we're like, all right, today I, may, I talked to a hundred people today. That's why I look at my KPIs weekly. Mm. or even bi-weekly, or even monthly, right? So you have, and every industry is different, right? So it, it's data, but it's activity. You've got to take action. That's, people are scared to know, right? So I grew up playing sports, I, I, um, being competitive. You're winning, you're losing. You're understanding how to take the losses and make the changes, right? 
You lose a judo match. You lose a football game. You fumble the ball on the two-yard line. What did I do wrong? How could I do it better? But it's, it's discipline, right? Yep. It's discipline, doing what's necessary, not what you like. People confuse success with doing what you – people confuse – let me re-say this. People confuse success with doing what you want to do. That's not what success is. Success is doing what's necessary, right? I don't want to run into a six foot four, 380 pound defensive lineman, but we need one yard for the first down. That's what's necessary. Mm. I'm going to lower my head and get the one yard. I don't want to make a hundred phone calls a day, but that's what's necessary. And that's what, that's the line from success, right? The top 5% of earners in the world, the top 5% of successful people in the world, they do what's necessary, right? And then all of a sudden, what's necessary becomes DNA. I get up at 3 a.m. because I always have, right? I'm at the gym at 4 a.m. because I always have. In the beginning, it was, now if I don't do it, it's the opposite, right? Right. If I don't make 100 calls, I get nervous that I'm, I'm losing it, right? So it actually becomes DNA, but it, it, it's hard. That's the answer. It's hard to do. That's why this isn't a blueprint. It's a framework. You still got to put in the work. This isn't a magic bullet. Everybody wants, people meet me and they say, oh, okay, you've done this. What is it? What, how do you do it? You sit in the room and you make, you don't leave till you set an appointment. Because if you don't sell a house in 60 days, you're fired. Right. Right. So when it's, when you start from that place, it's difficult. It's different. But when you start, you get out and you get the job at Ernst & Young making 50 as a junior accountant and you work your way up and everything's gone smoothly. I've been in straight commission sales my whole career. There's been a loaded gun to my head every day at work. Right. Sell something or you're fired. So if that's the alternative, then you got to do it. And then that just becomes your DNA, right? And so tons of people want to write books. Yeah. I'd love to write a book someday. Yeah. It, is, it, it is a challenge, right? It's a challenge to find the material. It's a challenge to get right. it organized. It's a challenge to make yourself sit down and do right. it. You have your first book out. We've, we've referenced it several times today. But uh, we'll put it up on the monitor here and walk us through uh, the yeah, the million dollar sales yes. tune up. There we go, right there. Yeah. Uh, so walk us through how did you determine that you know you wanted to write a book? This is what you wanted it to be about, okay. and then walk us through kind of the the premise of the book. Okay. So writing a book's interesting. I had started. I think all of us start writing a book. I truly believe that. If you've done anything 10, 15, 20 years, twenty five years, I think if you've been successful at what you've been doing, you probably have a book in you. Even if you haven't been successful, you might have another story to tell. I think we've all started jotting down notes. And I got this idea, and I had been doing that over the years. And I got approached by a publisher, and Game, Change, Game Changing Publishing, and Game Changer Publishing, and uh, Chris Colley, and um, on LinkedIn. And they said, we'd like to talk with you. And I, said, I spoke with him. He said, tell us a little about your career. And I told him, they said, ah, it's interesting. We think you have something. I said, okay. So that was how it started. And I think for me, if you make an outline, right, you make mm -hmm. an outline of the premise, right? You want to introduce the topic and just outline bullet points and you start filling out bullet points, it, it makes it manageable. That's really the way I started, but I already had my system in place, right? I had already developed that system and I can go right into that or if there's specific. Yeah, no, absolutely. Go ahead. Okay. So, so what I did was I looked and I said, okay, I have my pillars. What are the things you need to do? So I call my pillars the fuel, you have to take action every day, right? Yep. Excuse me, let me take a step back. You need to learn. The pillars are learning every day, continuous learning, taking action every day, staying persistent, and being inspired. That's your fuel. Those are the four pillars. But when you're in sales, why do they, and everyone asks this, why do they say no and why do they say yes? It's actually, in my, in my eyes, it's the same four reasons. It's trust, urgency, and it's not urgency where we're trying to build urgency to trick them. It's understanding their buying timeline. Is it the right time? So trust, urgency, need, do they need it? And the emotional connection, the mm -hmm. emotions behind decision-making. A lot of studies done on that. In sales, if there's not an emotional connection, you, you might get the sale, but you're probably not gonna keep doing business with that person. But if you build it, so my system is about building that relationship, the tune sales system. So the trust, urgency, need, and emotion are the elements, right? Gotcha. You have the fuel and then the elements you wanna build right? Then the eight step sales process, right? And mm -hmm. then I have the three secret sauces, which are, I say secret sauces, 
is asking the right sales questions, which is open-ended questions to get people to speak, right. get the information, and the understanding the emotions behind decision-making. And last but not least, the push objection handling framework, which is my proprietary objection handling framework, which it, it has diff- it's basically just calms everything down, understand why it's a no, show the value, and boom, get the appointment, right? So that those so the elements, the the pro, the eight step process and the secret sauces is the path. You have the fuel and the path, and the top of it is financial freedom. I say, or if it's setting an appointment, whatever the end goal for you is, you know, it might, you might get the money, and it might be something else with the money, right? Something you know, take care of your family, but it gives you the money to make that get to that next step you're trying to get to. But the fuel and the path, right? And so in writing the book, it flushes it out even more and more and more. But that's how it started. It started with, you know, as documenting what I what I had been doing throughout my career. And my confidence came from I did the work. Right? right. I didn't take a class at school. I'm not a, you know, there's a lot of rah-rah business coaches, you know, do it, you know, 10 times harder. And that's fine. You need the mo- that's inspiration. That's great. Sure. Right, but the hands-on. What are we going to do? Because I'll sit when I the, the companies I work with, I sit down and make the cold calls with you. I'm going to sit with your sales team and I will make cold calls with them. They're going to see me. They're going to see people hang up on me. They're going to see how I handle it. They're going to see how I keep going. How I make the adjustments. I'm not someone that just hands you a manuscript. Uh, uh, here, here's 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 what you should do. Here's and a then, script. Yeah, here's a script, and you know, write you know, write the check out to me here, and then boom. If you need me to stay and go through it with you, I will. Right. Hence, you know, we do you know. We have the online training course, which will be Q1 next year, right? And then we have the group speaking where I can come do a group training, speak to you about my system, right? And then we have the one-on-one training. And then we have the sales advisory slash sales consulting where we can come in, look at what you're doing, assess your process and say, okay, this is where you could tighten it up. But um, this is my passion. You know, I, t- I turned my pain into my passion is what I did. That's awesome. We, we are running a little bit low on time here. Sure. So where can people pick up the book? Where can people find out more about you? Okay. So thank you, Scott. The book's on Amazon. Just put in Million Dollar Sales Tune-Up, Tony Kirtland, um, and it'll come up on Amazon, or you can go to TonyKirtland.com, and you can find out everything that's going on with me there. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So as we end the show, I always ask, what are your favorite books? Give me two, three favorite books. They can be business books, fiction books, doesn't matter. Business books, fiction. Okay, you got me on the spot here. Let me see. Um, I will say, let's see, favorite books. I'll say the Jurassic Park. Okay. We read that in 10th grade biology. <laughs> I love that book. The premise was so different. Right. Right? I'd never seen anything like that. Um, let's see. So it's it's a Steve Jobs autobiography by Sir, Sir Wal- Walter Isaacson. And it's fascinating. He followed Jobs around his last three years while he was passing away of pancreatic cancer. Mm-hmm. And the insight he gives about Jobs, his mentality, and, and in his and what he learned from him, it, it was fascinating to me. I'd say that would be number two. And then you say three. Two, two or three. Two. If you have a third one, that's fine. And most of the books I read are about sales process, you know, books about solution selling. Um, I read all the sales books out there. And that's how I learned, right? I, I learned from people and you put your own twist on things, right? So- all the all the salespeople, the Zig Ziglers, um, all the salespeople, the cold calling experts who came before me, and even the current guys. I don't see it as a competition. I just see it as they have their own version of doing it. That my version might resonate, and theirs might resonate better with a certain demographic. But um, I would say those are the two books. It's pretty simple. But I've read so many business and sales books; they all just become one blur. Right. If you want to be honest, uh, read a lot of, because they just keep changing the vernacular. It goes solution selling and it becomes, an, uh, at the end of the day, it's relationships. Right. At the end of the day, it's relationships. Absolutely. Well, Tony, thank you so much for being on here. Thank you everyone for tuning in and we will see you next time on the Driven Crowd Podcast. Mm-hmm.